I'm excited to get things started. As I mentioned earlier, today's webinar will be all about navigating life during and after college, and we'll be talking about uh, course success skills, academic integrity, and your next steps after college. I'm joined today by my colleagues and today's presenter, Dr. Amy Dietzman, Sarah Snyder, and Stephanie Close from our very own training and development team. And without further ado, I'll pass it on over to you, Amy. All right, thanks, Maxine. Welcome, everybody. So as Maxine just said, this is the fifth and final presentation on college readiness and management for high schoolers. If you did miss any of these previous presentations, then please watch them on our YouTube channel because we are talking about all the things you need to know from the point where you're just maybe a freshman or a sophomore in high school all the way until you're getting ready to graduate. Today, we're gonna talk about a wide variety of things related to life during and after college. First and foremost, we're gonna talk about considerations you should take when you're choosing where to live and many of the resources that are available to you on your campus. But then we're gonna get into some of those skills you learn in college that you can take with you for the rest of your life, including teamwork and self-leadership, attention management, which is kind of like a cousin to time management, and how to get into healthy routines that will help you be successful in college and in your life after college. So there are three main options for college living. Some campuses require that freshmen live on campus in the dorms for their first year. All the colleges that my sons considered did have this requirement. However, some schools may allow you to live at home with your parents, especially uh, if you live within a certain mile radius of the campus. And others may have no requirements at all. So you can choose to live off campus in an apartment. Let's talk about the social, emotional, and financial benefits of each of these options. So living at home with your family, if your college campus is close to your home, is a very viable option for many reasons. First off, it is the most affordable. If you can get in on some family dinners, grab a bowl of cereal before you head to class, and live rent-free or low rent, then it's a great option. One thing to consider, is that as an adult living at home, you should try to shift that relationship that you have with your family. It's not the same as when you were a high schooler living at home. Ask what you can do to help around the house or take on additional responsibilities. More than anything, open up the lines of communication and don't just expect that you're gonna continue living there without any responsibility and everything's just gonna stay the same. You want your family to respect you as much as you wanna respect them. Additionally, living at home provides many students with a much needed transition period. If you're not feeling really ready for the whole college experience, you can kind of dip your feet in the water a little bit by just doing classes and keeping the rest of your life mostly the same. And this is true if you're going to a community college as well. You are kind of going through a little bit of a transition period and saving some money at the same time. One thing that can be more expensive as a commuter student is the cost for transportation and for parking. This is something we had to learn. Parking fees on many college campuses are pretty steep. You will more than likely need a car and some gas money, so keep that in mind as you're thinking of your budget. On the other hand, off-campus living Provide students with the most independence as they are not constrained by school housing policies or meal plans or their parents or families. Also, off-campus students gain more real-world experience in things like paying their own bills or finding renter's insurance, cooking their own meals and negotiating or reviewing contracts. You do have the option of using financial aid for off-campus living. So when you're filling out that FAFSA, Keep in mind that you may be able to use some of those funds for rent, utilities, and other housing related expenses. If you aren't sure what I'm talking about when I say the FAFSA, remember that we just had another webinar all about financial literacy, and we really talk about it there, but we talk a little bit about the FAFSA in several of our webinars here. If the apartment you choose happens to be a student apartment, the leasing office will often accept rent based on when financial aid payments come through for students. So you may be able to pay a whole semester at one time when you get that 
financial aid check. This option comes with a lot of additional fees and bills, and you may have to buy furniture, and you will more than likely be required to sign a one-year lease rather than a nine or 10-month contract that follows the school year. So you wanna keep that in mind. Also think about things like, is parking extra? Do they require a security deposit? Do they want first and last month's rent at signing? Also consider the travel implications. Is there a bus or a shuttle that can take you to class? Can you walk? Or do you still have to drive and pay another parking fee to park on campus for that year? A lot of times you have to pay for parking at your apartment and then you'd have to pay for your parking on campus as well. So like you could see a double fee there. Living on campus in a dorm is more than likely the most convenient of all the options. It makes the whole world of your campus feel just a little bit smaller and a little bit more manageable. Megan Chibonga, Director of Residence Life and Student Housing at the University of New Mexico said, campuses can be big and intimidating, but when you live right next to hundreds of other students who are also trying to navigate the campus experience, there's a greater chance that you'll be able to make lasting and meaningful connections that can help you on your journey through college and will extend well beyond the time you shared together in the same hallway. Some research has shown that freshmen and sophomores who live on campus have higher retention rates than their peers who live off campus. Retention rate meaning they stay in school longer. And this is because living on campus increases the likelihood that you will get engaged. It's easier to get to events, attend club meetings, go to sporting things, all those kinds of things if all you have to do is walk across campus versus driving from your apartment or your house that's across town. Unlike off-campus housing, the total cost of living on campus is typically all-inclusive. It covers rent, utilities, furniture, Wi-Fi, and a meal plan. Now, this was great for my son, who just finished his freshman year of college, and he was required to live on campus. So he would hit the dining hall four to five times a day to eat, fill up his drink, he'd grab some snacks. And while the cost of the meal plan seemed expensive at first because we went with the highest level knowing that he loved to eat, well, when we divided it up by the number of times he visited each day, it was actually a huge cost savings for us. In addition, some schools won't let freshmen have cars on campus. For example, UNC Asheville requires that all freshmen live on campus, but then they include a city bus pass in the cost of tuition so students can get around town without needing a car. So that's something to consider. Now, since we're talking about getting involved and utilizing your resources on campus when you live on campus, let's move on to what resources there are for you. There we go. Most schools have writing and tutoring centers. These are excellent resources that you should use. When you need any kind of help, whether with a paper or an assignment, no matter how big or how small, tutors are there to help you. And you don't have to do this alone. You should note that we are tutor.com and tutoring is what we do. So it, you may have access to our service for free through your school. Next is career services. The career center on most campuses, it's far more than a job placement office. Most of today's career offices can help you choose a major, explore careers within a chosen, chosen major, discover your strengths and talents, find on and off campus jobs, and seek out internships. Career centers also offer help with resume building, interview skills, and workplace expectations. So if your school doesn't offer career services, just we also have that at tutor.com, and that's what we are. And then Library services, these are super important. I had no idea what a librarian could do for me until I was so much older, but librarians do way more than just hang out in the library. They can help you find resources if you're struggling, looking for something because you're writing a difficult research paper. They can order resources for you if you have a particular journal article or book that you need. They can even help you with search strategies if you can't find anything for your topic and you're just searching all over the online library. They can help you with that. Financial aid offices and advisors are super important to help you figure out your finances. There are all kinds of advisors on most campuses. The main thing you have to do is ask. 
ask questions and ask for support. I know how hard that is. College campuses also have resources for students with disabilities and not just physical disabilities, but they can also assist students who have learning disabilities as well. Your support, if you have a learning disability, does not end when you are just finishing high school. And then there's health resources, even mental health resources. Those are also probably available to you in some way or another. Uh, my son gets his allergy shots at his health center on campus. They aren't just available to you if you're sick, but if you're feeling anxiety or depression, which is very common, you may be able to get help from a counselor, either in person or via video chat. And lastly, there are multicultural student support resources, which may also be available to you and can offer support for minority students or international students, even students who need some support and friends in the LGBTQ community. No matter your struggles or your questions, there are so many helpful people around your campus that can help you. And guess what? A lot of this is included with your tuition. So now we're gonna talk about mentors. The great thing about a mentor is that unlike any other relationship you have in your life, you more than likely probably have someone who supports you and your goals, but you probably don't have that one person whose sole responsibility is to invest in you, respect you and your goals and your dreams no matter what, listen to you. So many of our relationships are two-way streets. You know, I listen to you and you listen to me. That's a friendship. But a mentor relationship is a little bit different because their role is just to listen to you and then show empathy, but then also see solutions and opportunities to your challenges and guide you. And lastly, a mentor should demonstrate flexibility. As you grow and your needs change, they adapt with you. How I met my mentor? Well, this shows how students find mentors. The most common way is in class. This tells me students are connecting to their professors or other class leaders, more likely than not, or perhaps other students who are just more experienced. Others find mentors through clubs or organizations, through jobs or internships, or through formal mentoring programs, which many colleges offer. My son, who I already told you about, just started college, he's about to start his second year, he met his mentor at his summer job before he even applied for college, and his mentor helped him actually write his college admission essay. He still meets his mentor for coffee or dinner regularly, and his mentor helps him set long-term goals. This relationship happened completely organically. My son just saw an opportunity to build a relationship. He started asking for advice, and they just grew into a relationship of a mentor and mentee. So be on the lookout for your own mentor. And this graphic from Inside Higher Ed shows how mentors have helped college students. Most give career advice or help students select classes or navigate student life. Others can help you network, decide on a major, or give advice on soft skills, which is what we're going to talk about now. I am going to pass it over to Sarah for some talk about why teamwork is so important in college and beyond. Thank you, Amy. Let's talk about teamwork. One of the reasons for going to college is the preparation that it provides for the workplace. I'm sure you're looking for your degree program to give you the content and technical knowledge that you need to succeed in your chosen field. But also important is the preparation it will give you in making yourself into an attractive candidate to win that first job out of college. Among the top five skills employers seek in a future employee and that play a role in predicting an employee's future success, we see these skills, leadership, critical thinking and problem solving, professionalism and a strong work ethic, oral and written communication skills, and teamwork and collaboration. Experience with teamwork is something employers are looking for. They want employees who are already skilled at working together, participating effectively in a team, collaborating effectively with other people from diverse backgrounds, considering new perspectives, and contributing to a community. Employers aren't looking for islands. But Sarah, I don't like working with a team. Well, I get it, I do. Let's look at some common objections to teamwork and then why we shouldn't let them stand in the way. You've probably thought or even said at least one of these things before. I can produce faster and better work alone than I can with a team. Working with a team is more frustrating than it's worth. What's the point? 
teamwork is too slow and cumbersome to be worth the effort. I always end up doing all the work when I'm on a team, so I might as well just work alone. So-and-so always takes the lead and leads us in the wrong direction. While each of these may have a little merit in and of themselves, a look at the benefits to teamwork will show us that they probably shouldn't influence us as much as we might let them when compared to the positive side of the picture. So let's start by looking at some of the benefits of teamwork, particularly group projects or team collaborations in school. Teamwork encourages creative brainstorming as ideas that you hear from others or they hear from you trigger new thoughts or innovations. It encourages appreciation for diverse perspective. Hearing things you didn't think of or experiencing problem solving in a way you hadn't thought of is invaluable to growing your own contributions to teams as you process those new experiences and they influence your thought process. Teamwork encourages diverse relationship building because you will invariably be grouped with people who are not exactly like you. Healthy relationships are vital to the success of a group. So learning to build relationships with those who are different from you will make your group more successful. Teamwork grows confidence and self-esteem. Seeing yourself as a part of the greater team, having your contributions considered and taking part in the success of the group can make you a more confident student, employee and person in general. And teamwork gives you a great opportunity to learn from others. By hearing varied perspectives, experiences, knowledge about a topic, you have the chance to develop your own views and knowledge with that input. But you promised teamwork and collaboration would help me enter a competitive workforce. I don't really see that here. Well, let's look at four more significant benefits to teamwork. Teamwork can grow your leadership skills as you take on or experience leadership in a group project setting your critical thinking skills as you problem solve with others, your work ethic as you are required to be accountable to people other than your instructor, help set group deadlines, and experience repercussions of missed deadlines by yourself or others, and your communication skills as you navigate each aspect of a project and communicating with diverse team members. Do these look familiar? These are the other four pieces of our pie that showed us the top five things employers are looking for. So work done in teams, whether in school teams or work teams, helps to build all the other pieces of what will make you a more attractive candidate. You might be wondering if it's true in practice that employers are looking for someone with experience working in a team. <laughs> One of my responsibilities here at tutor.com is conducting interviews for new open positions at the corporate level. One of the things we ask in every interview is for the candidate to tell us about a time when they were on a team or collaborated with a team. The reason we wanna know is that we have a very collaborative team and wanna know what they are gonna be bringing into that. It's a broad and vague question on purpose. We want to give candidates free reign to answer that question however they see fit. You might be surprised just how many people struggle with their response. We recently interviewed 11 people for a new opening on our team. Of those 11 people, only one person even remotely answered that question well. That applicant shared a little about the process of working as a team and a little about strategies employed. Yeah, it wasn't much, but it was better than the other 10. What the other 10 shared, believe it or not, could all be boiled down to essentially saying, I was on a team once. Wow, that's really all they had to say. I can tell you with certainty from the employer perspective that you will stand out among the competition if you can answer that question well. You can talk about strategies your team employed, brainstorming techniques that you used, timeline management that you handled, and so on. But to answer it well, you first need experience, and school is an excellent place to get it. So don't shy away. In addition to embracing teamwork opportunities and allowing them to support the growth of your core success skills, communication, leadership, critical thinking, work ethic, self-leadership also plays a critical role in success. What is self-leadership? Charles Mann's author and leadership professor says about leadership that it is about influencing ourselves, creating the self-motivation and self-direction we need to accomplish what we want to accomplish. 
Brian Tracy, author and motivational speaker says, self-leadership means you accept complete responsibility for your results and outcomes. You don't blame other people. You don't make excuses. You say, I am responsible. And Lao Tzu, ancient Chinese philosopher says that mastering others is strength, but mastering yourself is true power. He also says this, watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. And watch your character. It becomes your destiny. At the heart of all of this is the idea of personal mastery. That is the core of self-leadership. So take, let's take a look at how this plays out in the college experience. You might be wondering, what does self-leadership self really look like? Well, three big things you can own in college are your academic path, getting from start to finish on your complete academic journey, your degree path, getting from start to finish on each degree or certificate that might be a part of that academic journey, and your course path, getting from start to finish on each course that makes up a degree or certificate that you've targeted. The first thing to grapple with is your academic path. What are your long-term goals? How are you going to get there? Right now, you're probably just thinking about what comes next after high school. But I would encourage you to think further down the road as you're making your decisions about college. What do you plan to do after you graduate? There are a lot of options, things like graduate school, starting your career, taking a gap year before graduate school, or starting your career, interning, volunteering, such as in the Peace Corps, teaching abroad, or more. What you plan to do after college can play a significant role in the decisions you make going into college and during your college experience. How does this play out? Well, you need to have a plan. Let's look at an example. Let's say that the career you desire requires an MBA, a business school graduate degree. Many MBA pro programs require work experience before they will accept you. They expect that you're going to have your bachelor's degree, you're gonna go work in the field, and then you're gonna come back for your MBA. Know that going into college, You'll want to put some effort into networking, interning, et cetera, to help ensure you're ready to get a job in your field right away. That will set you up for starting grad school as soon as possible after you've met whatever workforce requirement they have. If you want to spend a year in the Peace Corps before starting your career, for example, start that discussion with them while you're still in college so the transition is as quick and seamless as possible. You don't want to find yourself at your college graduation with no plans for your next steps or having not met the requirements to take your desired next steps right away. Part of self-leadership is also owning your degree path. Take charge of your education in all respects, not just in where to go to school or which program you enter, but also in which classes you take, how many at a time, when in the day, what mode of instruction, in what order to the extent that those things are customizable in the program that you've chosen. Academic counselors are a great resource for academic guidance and a great place to get your questions answered. Don't rely solely on someone else to tell you how to get from start to finish though. Course catalogs are packed with information about degree requirements, what courses are required, how many electives you need, information like that, course pre or co-requisites, those courses you need to take before or at the same time as another course, and suggested course sequences, maybe an optional but strongly recommended order for taking a set of courses. If you have questions about what you read there or you need to know which academic year's course catalog applies to you, the academic counselors are there to answer those kinds of questions. And then course schedules, which are typically posted a semester at a time in advance of registration deadlines, contain information about instructional modes. Is it a classroom lecture, a lab, a hybrid class, an online class? Days and times that the course is offered, often there are multiple choices per semester, and specifics about which instructor is teaching each section of the course. Again, academic counselors are great to ask questions about what you find there. But because an academic counselor will never be as familiar with your work and family obligations as you are, it's a great idea to tackle a degree plan on your own before asking an academic counselor to review it. 
Use your knowledge of you to your advantage. You know how quickly you wanna get through your program. And in any given term, you know the obligations on your calendar to work around with the courses you choose. Having that intimate knowledge of where you are, where you're going and how you plan to get there should set you up for a more successful college experience than just leaving it all for someone else to figure out and dictate to you. You're going to have more personal investment, which will generally lead to more follow through. And fundamental to the academic work you do, colleges have an expectation that the choices you make will reflect integrity and responsible behavior. Occasionally, you may feel overwhelmed by the amount of work you need to accomplish. You may be short on time, working several assignments that are due on the same day, or preparing for multiple exams at once. The pressure of your college work can be intense. Many resources are available to help you manage your workload and prevent yourself from becoming overwhelmed, so be sure to take advantage. Some examples are asking your instructor or supervisor for help, finding or even creating tutoring or study groups, or seeking counsel from your college's student support services. Many times, libraries have groups you can join or speakers that you could hear to get proven strategies for managing stress and anxiety, for example. No matter what level of stress you may find yourself under, though, the expectation is that you will approach your academic work with honesty and integrity. As MIT states, honesty is the foundation of good academic work. It is important to avoid engaging in plagiarism, cheating, or any type of dishonesty surrounding your work. Trust the value of your own intellect, credit others for their work, accept corrections as part of the learning process, demonstrate your own achievements, and showcase your unique abilities. The third aspect that you want to own is your course path. What I mean by that is the path from start to finish of an individual course. Make a plan for how you're going to successfully complete college algebra, for example. Here are some tools that will help, especially if you start using them from the very first day of class. Academic planners, these come in a whole variety of styles, including digital forms. MyStudyLife.com is a free online academic planner. It helps with scheduling, tasks lists, and reminders, helping you keep your calendar organized. Study groups are a great way to network with peers and also compare notes. Revisiting your notes with peers can help you fill in blanks and reinforce what was taught in class. And even if you understand it all, every time you teach material to another person, you learn it that much better. So being the more prepared in the group has its benefits too. And if your instructor or a TA or other course supplemental instructor has made office hours available, take advantage from the first day. Even if you don't have questions, go check out office hours during that first week being comfortable with where the room is and introducing yourself to the instructor or TA during that first week will make it tremendously more likely that you'll take advantage of those office hours later in the semester when you really do need them. You won't have the stress of the unknown added to the stress of not understanding the material. Now I'm gonna hand things over to Stephanie to talk more about the practical side of managing your time effectively and balancing all those priorities well so that you can be your most successful self through your college experience. Thank you, Sarah. So let's face it, school is a big commitment, but it is a commitment with great rewards. As you dive into your schoolwork, you may find yourself wishing for more control over your time. While we may not be able to control how much or little time we have in a given day, we can control what we focus on, our attention. So when we say attention management, what does that really mean? Attention management is a practice where we reduce or remove the influence of external factors to be able to focus our attention. This helps us throughout the day to be mindful of our energy level and our state of mind. Then we use that focused attention to help control our environment and get things done. In other words, instead of responding, reacting to, or getting distracted by things around us, we decide what to focus on and when, and we pair up our tasks and our ability to attend to those tasks in an intentional way. 
If you do your schoolwork in a room that looks like this, you might find yourself slightly distracted. So how do you control your environment? First up, you want to remove or limit distractions. Find a quiet and neat, or at least a little neater than this area in your house or dorm. If that doesn't exist, go somewhere else. A library, a public workspace, even a quiet tree in the shade outside. If you are at home, close your door, lock it if you can. Consider listening to some focus music. That will make it easier to tune out other things happening around you. Additionally, be aware of all those tech distractions. Set your phone to silent or do not disturb. Next, you want to stop multitasking. I'm sure you've all heard of multitasking and were probably led to believe that it was a good skill to have, right? Well, it's not really possible. There are very few things that can be done and done well at the same time. What you might perceive to be multitasking is actually task switching, and it takes more of our energy and therefore robs our focus to be constantly jumping back and forth between tasks. So let's try this out. I'd like you all to do something. If you can open the chat, and type in the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'll give you a minute to try that out. So just type those numbers into the chat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, if you're not typing them, maybe you could even try writing them down. Now type the word multitask or jot it down on a little piece of paper next to you. Okay, now I'd like you to type both of them, but I'd like you to alternate between the two. So number, letter, number, letter. letter. For example, 1M, 2U, 3L. So go ahead and try that out. That probably feels a little different, right? Maybe it felt confusing, it took you longer jumping back and forth, and maybe you even felt unsuccessful. And none of those feel very good. A great solution to this is to get into the habit of unitasking. Try to focus on doing one thing for 20 minutes and build up from there. This will promote that focus and mindful attention that we've been talking about. Another concept you can try out is batch tasking. I used to be a notorious instant text responder. A text message or notification would come in on my phone and I would respond right away, no matter what I might have been in the middle of doing. Think about if you've ever been in a conversation with someone face-to-face, -face, you get a phone notification, look down and start responding, only to leave the person you're having a conversation with standing there staring at you waiting. This instant responding not only pulls focus away from other people, schoolwork, or your thought process, but it takes a lot of energy, more than you probably realize. Now I use batch tasking. I intentionally schedule a specific time to go through and read and answer a big batch of notifications and texts in one sitting. This allows my brain time to filter out distractions and only look at the task in front of me. It helps me control my environment and naturally increases my productivity and success. As with anything, it's also very important to take breaks. This helps improve your mental health and well being. It restores your focus and attention, increases creativity, and can prevent fatigue. You can do something as simple as standing up and doing a quick stretch to taking a 15 to 20 minute walk outside to get some exercise and fresh air. And my personal favorite, don't forget to reward yourself. That's the best part. When you complete a set of tasks on your to-do list, you should celebrate that. This stimulates dopamine, that feel good chemical, to release in your brain. Your brain then elicits positive emotions 
leading to the realization that your efforts result in a positive reward. By doing this continuously, your brain will start to link pleasure to accomplishing the task or objective and naturally move towards that again in the future. Some ideas of rewards for yourself, call a friend that makes you smile, give yourself a day to be lazy because you can, you got all your stuff done. Enjoy a coffee date or lunch at your favorite place, plan a night out, play a video game, attend one of your favorite sporting events, indulge in a sweet treat, take a nice hike, a guilt-free nap, or even buy something new for yourself. The possibilities are endless. So deadlines, the dreaded word, project due dates, application submittals, homework assignments, we've all got them. But how do we manage them so they don't cause us stress? Planning and prioritizing are the keys. Whether mapping out a larger goal or constructing your to-dos, you'll want to make a plan. To start, make a list of assignments and due dates. Plan it out and allow enough time for each activity. If you use an online calendar, plug in time for each task. Try 30 to 90 minute blocks that are labeled with what you'll be working on. By having a to-do list and working through that list throughout the day or week, it removes decision-making. Then we're likely to maintain our willpower to get things done. It takes energy to make a decision. As we make decisions throughout the day, even decisions about things that in the grand scheme of things don't really matter, we have less and less energy. If not managed properly, we can burn out. So plan it out and make a to-do list. Then just work through it little by little. It's like that saying, how do you eat an elephant? The elephant being your giant list of assignments or to-dos, you eat it one bite at a time. Another idea is right when you start your day, look at the calendar and make a call on your energy level. If you put studying in the morning, but you're not a morning person, or you wake up that day and you're not really feeling sharp yet, plan a more enjoyable task, like putting those finishing touches on a project you love and swap them around. Be flexible with yourself. Notice how you're feeling and adjust. I find that by doing these task blocking strategies, it helps to minimize distractions and limits my multitasking. Then I can focus on that single task I need to get done, which goes right back to that attention management piece that we just discussed. Pretty cool how it all ties together. So we've talked about attention management and deadline management. Now let's talk about putting those together and learn how to manage our time effectively. By learning how to manage our time, we can increase our productivity and our overall success. Learning how to effectively manage your time, especially when there are a lot of distractions around you, is an important skill that will help you the rest of your life. You may have heard of Stephen Covey. He wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. He says that people who have mastered time management understand where their priorities fall. He created a graphic that breaks down priorities into four different quadrants. This four quadrant system helps you categorize each task or responsibility so you can focus on improving your relationship, personal growth, and accomplishments. Quadrant one or Q1 are the urgent and important priorities. These are things that need our immediate attention and require quick action. The items in this quadrant may be stressors due to their urgency. So being aware of these tasks can ensure you focus the necessary time and effort on them. These may be impending deadlines, time sensitive goals, or a task involving an immediate risk. Think of this quadrant as the do it items. Quadrant two are priorities that are not urgent, but important. These are tasks that have a direct relation to overall goals and may require planning and additional steps. Q2 is the heart of effective personal management. These are things like building relationships, setting long range goals and proactive work. 
It's all those things we know we need to do that we have control over. People that spend their time in Q2 spend their time being effective and efficient. It's important to note that Quadrant 2 still leaves time for recreation and creative thinking. It's not all work. Think of this quadrant as the schedule it items. Quadrant three are tasks that are urgent, but not important. These are things that seem to matter in the moment, but they can be removed or at least reduced. These are usually distractions that interrupt your productivity. These are needless interruptions, like those text messages and phone notifications. Some people spend a lot of time dealing with Q3 tasks and confusing them with Q1 tasks. They think the tasks are important when they actually are not. This is why Q3 is called the quadrant of deception. And many times the urgency of these tasks is due to others' priorities or needs and not yours. A good way to differentiate a Q3 task from a Q1 task is to ask yourself, is this task related to my goals? Is this task going to get me closer to graduation? Is this task going to help me get a better job? You can think of this quadrant as the avoid it items. Quadrant four is called the quadrant of waste and for good reason. It contains all your time wasters. These are things that are not urgent or important. A lot of people have a tendency to hover around quadrants three and four. After resolving their Q3 tasks, they enter into autopilot mode and spend all their time in Q4. This can be because they have nothing better to do or they are procrastinating on the things they should be doing. Quadrant four creates no value in our lives whatsoever. Note the word excessive is in this quadrant. It has to be excessive to fall here. A good question to ask yourself if it's excessive is, did that just keep me from doing something I should be doing? Do I feel fulfilled now that I just spent two hours on TikTok? If your answer is no, you probably need to cut it down. You can think of this quadrant as the deleted items. There are many benefits of using this time management matrix and categorizing your tasks into these four quadrants. You can increase your productivity, have more clear and defined habits, create more of a work-life balance for yourself, and improve your planning skills. So how do you do it? First, list the tasks you need to complete. You can do it for each day or each week or even for a month, but write them all down in brief but clear statements. Second, include deadlines. After each task listed, include their deadline. Knowing when things need to be done can help you prioritize what needs to come first and what can wait until later. Make a note of deadlines that are quickly approaching. Third, identify the most urgent tasks, which deadlines are the closest. This allows you to put your tasks into perspective when it comes to prioritizing them. Next, organize by importance. After determining how urgent each task is, order your tasks according to their importance. Then you can place them in their corresponding quadrant. You can then begin using this organization of the matrix to complete tasks throughout your day, week, or month. And lastly, don't forget to assess your productivity. After using this method for a few weeks or a month, reflect on how it went for you. Did it help you manage your time more efficiently? Were you able to be more productive and successful? You can use your findings to adjust as needed and determine if some tasks need to be moved to a different quadrant. Here are some tried and true strategies you can use to successfully make a plan and effectively schedule your priorities so that it works for you. The first strategy, and probably my favorite, is eat the frog but please don't actually eat any frogs. Author Brian Tracy introduced a concept he calls eat the frog, inspired by a quote by Mark Twain. If the first thing you do in the morning is eat the frog, 
then you can continue your day with the satisfaction of knowing that it is probably the worst thing that will happen to you all day. In terms of effective living, this means that you complete the hardest task first. You get it out of the way. You'll feel awesome that you did it. And now all you have left on your list are easier items to complete. Another strategy is habit stacking. In James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, he talks all about habit stacking. The idea is to take an existing sequence of habits that you already do and insert a new habit. For example, maybe you would like to start reading more in the evenings. After you wake up and go through your morning routine, add placing in a book on your pillow before you head off on your day. Then when you get home and you're ready for bed, your book is there waiting for you to enjoy and read. By adding that new habit into what you already do can help you create a new positive habit. You could also try the one, three, five rule. The founder of themuse.com, a career website, is a big proponent of this prioritization strategy. It is wonderfully simple, but it makes a lot of sense. The gist of this is that you begin each day by assuming you can only accomplish one big thing, three medium things, and five small things. Ideally, you create this list the night before so that you wake up and hit the ground running. If you're spread thin and you have a lot of other commitments, you can always tweak this rule to a one, two, three rule. Only you know how much you can accomplish each day, but you can make it work for you. These strategies will help you focus and give you a clear picture of what can and cannot be done. And they help you plan and prioritize what needs to get done and when. Routines are another way to help keep us on track, both mentally and physically, which can help make our days more positive and productive. A routine helps improve mental health by organizing the overwhelming everyday tasks into a pattern that seems easier to accomplish. Routines can be enjoyable and fulfilling. They can help you manage stress more effectively, sleep better, eat healthier, and be more active. It is important to establish and honor your routines. Here are a few you can try right away. Avoid the snooze button. Your alarm starts beeping. You know you should get up and start your day, but you just need 10 more minutes. You reach over and hit that snooze and roll over. Sound familiar? It's totally normal to want to hit snooze, and plenty of us do it. But fighting your alarm on a regular basis and creating that routine can actually leave you feeling more tired during the day and sleep worse at night. It can mess with your sweet sleep quality and have negative impacts on your sleep over time. Create a new routine and just get out of bed. No snooze. It might be hard at first, but eventually it will get easier. And you'll feel like you've already successfully accomplished something the moment you wake up. Win, win. Another idea <clears throat> is to create an evening routine. This can help wrap up the day set you up for a restful sleep, and even take some prep work and decision-making out of your tomorrow. Lay out what you'll wear. That's one less decision you'll have to make in the morning. There are quick and easy breakfasts you can prep beforehand, like overnight oats or egg muffins, breakfast bars. Pinterest is a great resource for meal prep ideas. And write down your to-dos or any important reminders for tomorrow. The idea being, if you get it out of your head and onto paper, then it's not swirling around in your mind, keeping you awake. And lastly, make winding down part of your daily routine. Don't just study or do work right up until you need to go to bed. Give yourself time to unwind and relax a little. You can read a book for pleasure, have a cup of sleepy time tea, listen to a bedtime playlist or meditation. There are a lot of great and free apps out there. Do some evening stretches before getting into bed or even turn off the bright room lights and turn on a nice soft light like a salt lamp as you're getting ready for bed. Whatever your routine, 
Aim to go to bed at the same time each night, ideally allowing for seven to eight hours of sleep. As APRN Cheryl Boutel says, a routine is how you build habits. Building these routines and long-term habits now will help you during college and for the rest of your life. You will be surprised how many habits you create now, good and bad, that are habits you will still have 20 to 30 years from now. It's never too soon to make good routines and habits for yourself. And remember, it's not all about your to-dos. Attention management, deadline management, and time management are vital to productivity and efficiency, but you can't pour from an empty cup. So it's equally important to set aside time to do things that re-energize you. Go outside. I'll be the first to admit this can be a challenge. We live in the day of Instacart, DoorDash, and Amazon. There aren't just a lot of scenarios that require us to leave our cozy abodes, but setting aside time to go outside improves concentration, creativity, <clears throat> and even provides a healthy dose of vitamin D which is crucial for a function, functional immune system, healthy cells, strong bones, and reducing inflammation. According to the US Department of Agriculture, being outside in green spaces supports an active and healthy lifestyle, which has been shown to increase life expectancy, improve sleep quality, and reduce cancer risks. But you don't need a study to know that it just feels good to be outside in the fresh air. Don't forget to exercise your mind and your body. Walking is great, it's free and it's easy. You can also stretch, try a sport, take up a dance class, or practice yoga, even if it's from your room. Yoga with Adrian is a personal favorite of mine and you can find free classes for all levels on her YouTube channel. And don't forget to flex the muscles in your brain too. Take some time each week to do something other than studying. Even if it's just a few minutes a day, pick up, pick up reading, solve a puzzle, or enjoy a new hobby. Those popular daily wordles are great for this. And lastly, get involved. Reach out to a friend for coffee, have a regular standing chat with someone you love, even if it's virtual. Get together with some friends that you have common interests with. Volunteer for a cause you're passionate about. Join a special interest club or help organize something for your community. There are lots of different ways to get involved and doing so can help you make new friends, establish a network around you, pursue special interests and hobbies, and enjoy a more fulfilling college experience. It provides a very needed break from schoolwork and helps to give you that balance you need in your life. So with this, we are wrapping up the fifth installment of a series about college readiness. If you missed any of these webinars or want to revisit them, you can find them on our YouTube page. And now I will pass this back to Maxine and we thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Now, before we get to questions, I do just want to highlight, please follow us on our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube pages. That way, any of our upcoming webinars, you'll just get some more information about those ahead of time. And then on our YouTube channel, we have all of our previous webinars. So everything from this current series that we're just finishing off, as well as a bunch of other topics that we actually discussed briefly in today's webinar. Um, now, we do have one question. Uh, now, Sarah, you mentioned that teamwork and collaboration are super important skills to develop, but sometimes there could be issues within the group. What tips do you have on navigating a group that isn't gelling and as a result, maybe missing deadlines? That's a really great question. One of the best ways to handle that is prevention, if at all possible. And that comes from setting up clear expectations at the beginning of your work as a team, that this is the way this team is going to operate and setting out clear responsibilities. You are responsible for this, you are responsible for this and having someone to manage the deadlines and follow up. 
But of course, that doesn't always work the way that we would like it to work. And sometimes you do have a little bit of dysfunction in a group. The first thing that you should do is address it directly with the person who you're having dysfunction with. And perhaps it's just a matter of miscommunication or they have too much going on. And there's other ways that you could reorganize the work so that everybody can participate in the way that matches their strengths and their bandwidth. If it goes beyond that and nothing is being corrected through communication inside of the team, then you take it outside of the team. And then in the case of a college course project, that would involve bringing in the instructor. These are the things that we're struggling with. These are the things we've tried to correct it. It's not being corrected. And there may be things that they can help you with with that, but also to make sure that they are aware that you're facing these challenges is really important. Thank you so much. That was such a great answer. And I believe we actually have a previous webinar where we talk a lot about teamwork and collaboration, which you can find yes. on our YouTube channel. So uh, you can feel free, uh, anybody who's interested in learning a little bit more on heading over there, uh, we go over some really great topics and kind of use case scenarios. Now, it looks like we're coming up to time. So I wanted to thank everybody who joined us today, as mm -hmm. well as uh, Sarah, Stephanie, and Amy. Thank you so much for the webinar. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you, everyone. All right. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you.